Welcome to the sixth annual State of the City address given by Mayor Judith Kennedy. We appreciate her coming out here on this nice hot day. Well, it's not as hot as it was yesterday, so we are fortunate for that. Anyways, my name is Tyrone Hawkins. I'm the president of Lynn Community Association, the folks who put on these events throughout the city. We also do other events. Uh, we do like MLK Day events. We also do um, fairs as a clean suite. We do um, things like resource fairs so we can get some information out to the community for children and families who may not know where to find resources. So we try to help that situation. Um, we also do youth events and so forth. So yeah, definitely look, look us up. We have flyers uh, out there. We have brochures. We've been around for probably seven years, maybe eight years. Uh, I've been a part of this organization for five of those years, um, and it's wonderful. So um, I want to point out some folks. Uh, our board members are here. Uh, my vice president is down there with the cool suit on, <laughs> Josh Goodwin. And uh, we have the Maitland twins, Duncan and Douglas Maitland. And of course, we all know Mary Jahan, who's back there. She's the founder of this wonderful organization, which started off, I guess, as a guarding type of thing, and then went to blossom to a beautiful thing of, of creating wonderful community in Lynn. So we promote pride in education and recreation and neighborly relationships throughout Lynn. Uh, we used to be East Lynn, so now we are All Lynn, which is beautiful. So definitely, we're also looking for like volunteers, board members, and things like that. So check us out if you're interested in what we do. Check out our website, lincommunity.org. Um, so anyways, so we're going to have a wonderful event because I love this, to hear what's going on in the city. Judy, Judy definitely gives us all of what we need to hear. So. Um, we want to definitely um, give her a shout out for that. We also want to give a, uh, and I like saying shout out because, you know, that's my word. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, to Jack Suslack. And I hope I'm not chopping your name up, Jack, wherever you are. Is that about right? Right on. Helped us get this wonderful place. Um, we really appreciate you guys hosting this for us. Um, so without further ado, I hear there's going to be a great video that's going to be played here, um, talking about Lynn, the beautiful things that's going on in Lynn. Um, I definitely support all the things going on in Lynn because it's definitely the city to be in. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our mayor of Lynn, Judy Kennedy. <laughs> Well, Tyrone sure does know how to give introductions. Okay, I'm going to be up here for a minute and then off, but I promise you it's just temporarily off. I'm going to start off tonight by showing you a video that was produced for Jim Cowdell and the EDIC. And we're using this video to give potential developers a glimpse of what Lynn has to offer. So please sit back and enjoy, and I'll be with you in a couple minutes. proud to be a Lynn resident because I believe that Lynn is one of the few communities where the people care about one another. I'm a product of Lynn, so I'm born and raised here. And um, some of the best people I've ever met in my life are right here. They're hardworking people, they're honest, we're very proud of our city, and for good reason. You couldn't get me to move out of Lynn. I mean, I love the city. The people of Lynn are great. It's such a diverse community. You, know, you meet a lot of different types of people, a lot of different cultures, and everyone is friendly. You know, you go to the supermarket, no matter where you go, you're gonna run into somebody you know. The families that are here wanna stay here. They want the city to do well. We are probably 10 miles from Boston. We're about eight miles from Logan Airport. You're on the coast for a beautiful waterfront. So if you wanna live here, we have everything. 
you know, Lynn's a place that is happening. It's already happening and yet we can do more. I get to travel around the state, I get to see communities, uh, small towns, big cities, and uh, what I see in Lynn is uh, its ability to, to host commercial businesses but also be a great place to live. I feel like my heart has always been in Lynn and this is really where we wanted to kind of plant our roots and start our family and uh, there's lots of great neighborhoods to do that. We've been in Lynn now for 23 years in November. We had outgrown our original location and my wife actually came across this building. With the help of the city of Lynn, we were able to purchase it and uh, do a lot of the renovations that transform this building completely, not just the building, but this general area as well. With the Michis and Rosettis uh, alongside of each other, it's certainly enlightened this whole block. And I've opened up you know, in, in three different cities now uh, in my life. And the city of Lynn uh, certainly is business friendly. That's huge, and I think they're on the move. As Lynn continues to prosper, folks are coming to us saying, hey, we want to be here. We have a workforce that's available. Any tool in the shed that we can offer for an incentive, we have it. Bienvenida a la ciudad de Lynn, una ciudad diversa que espera por ti. Anyone from any country, any place, you find them here in the city of Lynn. The North Shore Latino Business Association is here to support, to promote, to educate. Anything that we can do for the businesses, we're here to help. The thing that I love the most is the people. And 98% of my employees reside here in Lynn. You're standing right now in the middle of um, traditional breast, kind of where the whole process takes place. The city's been great to me um, in terms of the resources for employment, elected officials, the EDIC. It's been a great family. Everybody is incredibly helpful and willing to extend um, any helping hand that they possibly can. We're 14 months into our launch. We have about 150 accounts already. We're trying to brew fantastic beer and create a great atmosphere. Our natural resources are one of the first things people notice. We have a beautiful coastline. We have a 2,200 acre municipal forest land called Lynn Woods, um, one of the largest in the country. We have a gorgeous 18-hole golf course, and we have our downtown arts and culture district where we have many A-list shows at the Lynn Auditorium, which is a 2,200-seat concert hall located right here in City Hall. You know, it's about making sure that people see this as a destination for entertainment, making sure that people are coming here uh, for their night out. There's a lot of thriving businesses that you'll recognize that have their home in Lynn. We couldn't be happier to be here. It's taken off. We're going to be growing. We're hoping to expand. And uh, I love the success we've had here at the Blue Ox. One of the areas in which Lynn has been concentrating is economic development and more particularly the economic development along our waterfront. We just signed a deal for an $80 million investment, 355 residential units. So you're about to see a really vibrant waterfront and you are seeing a very vibrant downtown. Lynn likes to keep it real. We are definitely one of the most diverse and one of the most inviting cities in Massachusetts. Lynn is for real. Um, you know, I, I really do believe it. You know, it's not about bringing Lynn back. It's about helping people to understand that Lynn never went away. It's the real deal, and uh, a lot of people say uh, it's the up-and-coming city in Massachusetts, and I totally believe that, and I'm, I'm psyched to live here. I thought that they did a really good job and I thought this would be a great place to show it off to everybody. Um, we welcome your comments. Jim Cowdell is sitting in the back over on, as I'm looking, on my left uh, in a red shirt, beige khakis. And if you want to offer him any comments after this, he'd, he'd welcome them. I just want to start with a piece of housekeeping. The Lynn Community Association, who is so generously um, sponsoring this event, is now accept accepting ap applications for Lynn teens and organizations to partner with them for a production of a video through a grant from Essex Heritage. Um, they encourage any of the teens or organizations to sign up online at their website, lynncommunity.org. The deadline for sign up is August 15th, 2016, 
and you can find flyers outside, I believe, on the table as you come in or as you're going out. Um, I also want to thank the Knights of Columbus for hosting us tonight, Jack, Pat, and everybody else who's here in conjunction with the Knights. Thank you very much for hosting us here. It's most comfortable. So it's nice to be here at the Knights with all of you. The Lynn Community Associ Association is such a wonderful group of citizens that, much like the city of Lynn, has seen so much growth in the past few years. Tonight, I want to update you on a variety of developments, initiatives, progress, and growth we are experiencing here in our wonderful city of Lynn, Massachusetts. Across the city, we are making strides forward, from major improvements to our infrastructure, to smaller improvements to play equipment at our parks, to groundbreaking developments on acres and acres of long vacant land. Our team is hard at work, making this grand place we call home all that it can and should be. First, I'd just like to cover our infrastructure, and I'm going to start right down the street at one of the busiest intersections in the city, Wyoma Square, where we recently finished $6 million worth of improvements to the road, sidewalks, medians, and signals. Wyoma is the northwestern gateway to both the downtown and our Boston Street Carter, and hosts a wonderful, thriving business district. Its makeover will increase the viability of these businesses while streamlining traffic flow into the core of our city. Across the city, along our waterfront, you may have noticed the Linway continues to receive a much needed facelift. The road has been paved, pedestrian overpass painted, and the ornamental fence that has been in disarray for years was replaced just this past week. In addition, the stretch of the Linway from North Shore Community College to Eastern Avenue has been named part of the Essex Coastal Scenic Byway, a 90-mile roadway that links 14 coastal communities from Lynn to Salisbury and features scenic views, period architecture, historic sites, and recreational opportunities. The Linway is one of the four major entrances to our city, and its continued rehabilitation is wonderful news. Along with its current rehab, we continue to explore ideas on how best to afford pedestrians a safe way to cross its six lanes of traffic. My team is also working on a grant that will streamline the intersection at the Linway in Route 1A, across from the pending housing development at the former Beacon Chevrolet site. In all, our vision is to connect the city with the waterfront, creating a walkable, livable community that promotes human interaction. Large-scale projects aside, I know some of the most important issues affecting residents' daily lives are the smaller public infrastructure issues, such as potholes, sidewalks, trees, and snow removal. This past year, our Department of Public Works did yeoman's work complete, completing hundreds of smaller projects in your neighborhoods. Specifically, they have ground down 89,000 square feet of roadway, paved numerous streets with 7,400 tons of hot mix asphalt, and swept the entire city twice, removing more than 3,100 yards of trash and debris from our streets. In addition, to combat illegal dumping, the DPW is now accepting bulk waste items, such as mattresses and furniture, at the Commercial Street Transfer Station on most Saturdays. To date, approximately 112 tons of bulk waste has been disposed of in a responsible manner. Although trash and litter remain a constant tr struggle, the DPW has done a great job in keeping our city clean. On the budget and finances, I'm happy to report that the council unanimously approved my fiscal year 2017 budget. With an ever wary eye on the bottom line, we remain committed to balancing our budget, trimming excess, and resisting any attempt at unwise and unnecessary spending. Our bond rating remains solid at AA. It seems every year is a challenge, but rest assured, I will continue my pledge to be as prudent and penny-pinching, some would say cheap, as I can be with your tax dollars. On our own buildings and structures, much like the streets and roads, 
Keeping our publicly owned facilities in good repair is vital to the strength of the community. They showcase our history, house our employees, and are, in and of themselves, beautiful works of art and architecture. If you haven't been to the Grand Army of the Republic building, you are truly missing out. It is a wonderful resource that houses thousands of Civil War memorabilia, from original uniforms to flags and even Lincoln's signature. It is truly a hidden gem that we continue to rehabilitate and promote to the public. If you go, make sure you make your way to the Grand Meeting Hall on the top floor. It is a sight and experience you won't soon forget. Having completed what our master plan called for at High Rock Tower, we have now turned our attention to the stone cottage below. Our applications for historical grant funding have been successful and work continues today on the building's envelope. Our intention is eventually to utilize the cottage as meeting space in conjunction with the observatory at the top, at the top of High Rock Tower, which will be opening up once again on select Tuesday nights through the summer and fall. The schedule will be posted on the city's homepage. Down from High Rock and back across the Linway, we make our way to the marina, which continues its rehabilitation. We have literally brought the marina back from the brink of total ruin. We are now awaiting funding from FEMA, which will cap off restoration of the main gangway. Seaport and its accompanying boardwalk have been owned by the city since the 1970s and continue to be wonderful city assets, attracting people to the waterfront. From the waterfront inside to the air-conditioned Lynn Auditorium, I can't say enough about what the auditorium has become. When I was first elected, I was adamant that we create a destination to mass people together here in, er in order to spur on economic development. The auditorium is steadily becoming that destination. Thousands upon thousands are attending shows and the ripple effect it has had on not only the downtown, but the entire city is so evident. We went on sale with the Steve Miller Band last week, Boz Skaggs today, and we'll go on sale with Melissa Etheridge in a few weeks. Other shows on sale now include the Long Island medium, Teresa Caputo. Yes, Neil Sadaka, Pat Benatar, who will be here next week, and a host of other shows. We will continue to book more and more shows and utilize this wonderful resource to its intended and full potential. Less glamorous is all the work our inspectional services team coordinates on a daily basis. As such, we are replacing school boilers, fire station roofs and interiors, as well as electrical equip equipment and masonry repairs at a variety of buildings. Again, not so glamorous, but it is so important to keep up with our facilities, uh, including our schools. Now, North Shore Community College's ex expansion is well underway, and we're so excited to attend the ribbon cutting ceremony later this year. The expansion is testimony to how vital and important the college is to Lynn and the students who attend. In conjunction with the expansion, I'm ex excited to announce that the college intends to bring their bookstore out from within the confines of the building to a storefront location along Broad Street for all residents to utilize, something my team has been advocating for for years. On our own public K through 12 educational front, our new state-of-the-art 180,000 square foot Marshall Middle School opened this past April, several months ahead of schedule. The new Marshall will not only transform education for the approximately 1,100 students who attend, but will also help in transforming the surrounding neighborhood. In addition, we have moved our popular Lynn Police Student Academy to the new Marshall Middle School this summer, where kids participate in simulated police academy training, including physical PT, law instruction, and police procedures. The academy not only affords the kids insights into police work, it also helps our own police with youth relations. And I would just add, I wrote some of this before the events that have happened over the last couple of weeks and, and 
it's so very important that we get the kids off to a good start in their relationship with the police. We're also proceeding with plans to build additional space for our middle school students. We are well into the planning process for our new Pickering Middle School. Because of the tremendous expansion in our student population in recent years, the Massachusetts School Building Authority has informed us that we must build to accommodate nearly 1,700 students. If we were to try to fit all of these children into one school, we would end up building the largest middle school in the Commonwealth. This is not an acceptable option for the city. So we have been looking at other options, such as building two smaller middle schools at two separate sites, or building a larger building with two wings for two separate schools that would share common space, such as a cafeteria and gymnasium. While I personally would prefer the two-site option, the ultimate decision will rest with the MSBA. We will be submitting our report on our site reviews to them tomorrow and should know more about our options in a few weeks. On our parks and open space, I am happy to report that just about every park and playground in the entire city has been or will see renovations by the end of 2017. Two bond bills that I signed into law aimed at parks, open space, and our public structures will go a long way in ensuring the viability of these resources for years to come. In fact, just this past Friday, we took delivery of bathrooms for the Pennybrook Road entrance of Lynn Woods. You may remember I mentioned them last year. Not the most glorious project to tout, but very important to increasing the use and enjoyment of one of our largest and grandest national resources. I'll say it again, the woods are larger than Central Park and utilized by thousands every year for all sorts of outdoor activities. Other bond-related renovations completed or slated to begin include pickleball and bocce courts at Clark Park, a net climber and tack ride at Cook, basketball hoops and backboards at Gallagher, a spin rider at Magnolia, light improvements at Fraser Field, irrigation at Flax Pond, basketball hoops at Keeney, and wall repair at Goldfish Pond. These examples are just a smattering of what's in store for our parks. They are so vital to affording our kids alternatives to sitting indoors playing video games or watching YouTube. We will continue to do all we can to ensure they remain vibrant, clean, and safe places for our kids to play and grow. With the Frederick Douglass Bandstand rehabilitated, we next turned our attention to the smaller portion of the Lynn Common for repair. Following our master plan, we rehabilitated the walkway, installed new benches, landscaped the area, and we'll top it off with antique lighting later this fall. In addition, when rehabilitating the walkway, we ensured it was exactly a quarter mile around. We intend to promote this fact and we'll be doing so, and in doing so, we'll promote the walkway as a place to get your daily exercise in. Now one lap doesn't count as one mile. Four laps counts as one mile. Next up will be the large common, where just last Thursday, we dropped off our grant application to the state. Plans are similar to the smaller common and will feature tree trimming, landscaping, benches, the walkway, and period lighting. The common is an important gateway on the north to our downtown and on the south to both our Market Square businesses and our new Market Basket grocery store development. Across the street from the commons, we, re we recently removed two of the old original circa 1900 bronze lights from the library basement and sent them out for total restoration. As the story goes, many years ago, thieves wrapped a chain around the lights and used a car to pull them halfway down the common as sparks filled the air and the road. As you can imagine, they didn't get very far. However, after the theft, the lights were squirreled away in the basement of the library for years. Soon, they will be back in their rightful positions flanking the library's main staircase and completing the improvements we are making across the street in the small common. 
With regard to the arts and culture, um, I've mentioned the auditorium, the arts and cultural district is once again full of exciting news. Our farmer's market is well underway, open on Thursdays from now into the fall. We have music in Central Square on Wednesday afternoons, and we are gearing up for our popular beat the clock, rock to the clock, road race in September. Also, the mural on the side of the Lynn Arts Building is in the process of being completed by local artist Yeti Frankel. And we have been invited by the New England Foundation for the Arts to reapply in the fall for a grant to support public art at the corner of Mount Vernon Street outside of Central Square. On the economic front, can you say market basket? It's not the end all be all, but I do have to say, I couldn't be more excited about the reuse, or should I say use, of this property that has lain fallow for too many years. I recall in my first months in office, sitting in monthly meetings with the local GE officials, trying to get them to sell or redevelop their unused land across the city. After a few months with no commitments and no progress, I finally told the local officials that I was going to visit GE National Headquarters myself to get the partial redevelopment going. Well, my threat resulted in the national GE officials coming to Lynn to negotiate the eventual marketing and sale of land, particularly the 22 acres known as the factory of the future site. Finally, this past winter, and let's not forget a family feud thrown in there to delay things a little more too. Um, but this past winter, I attended a small ceremony and watched as the first piece of the factory of the future came down. Slated to open in August of 2017, Market Basket will bring at least 400 jobs to the city, additional property tax dollars, and will serve as an anchor for potential surrounding development. But the benefits to the city do not stop at merely having a new business. Market Basket has also signed an agreement with the city that will give Lynn residents priority in hiring for the new store. And Thanks to our economic and community development team, a MassWorks grant to the tune of $2.5 million will be used to improve the public roadways around the site. I'm also happy to report that three, actually four major projects continue to move forward on and around the Linway. The first is just off the uh, Linway on Washington Street, Lower Washington Street. We have 71 units being built on the site of the former Blue Note uh, bar. The Beacon Chevrolet site that I referenced before is steadily moving forward. That is an $80 million project, as are the South Harbor site on the ocean side of the Linway and the Gear Plant site on the western side of the Linway. These bookend developments could act as rainmaker projects when completed and, like Market Basket, attract other developments. In addition to these large projects, a host of smaller businesses have recently opened their doors here in Lynn. To name just a few, Bentwater, who was featured in our video, Lynn's very own microbrewery, is doing very well on Commercial Street. Trio's Mexican Grill has opened on Market Street. Land of a Thousand Hills is selling Java on Monroe Street. Pick Up Modern, which is a high-end consignment and design store, is attracting a wider and eclectic clientele to our cultural district. Velocity Fitness on Eastern Avenue is pumping iron. Cafe Columbia on Acorn Street is serving lunch and dinner. And K Security Systems on Boston Street is open for business. In addition, we held a ribbon cutting ceremony at the former Arnold Stationery Building just a few months ago, where artist lofts are now for sale in the cultural district. Assisting these businesses, Community Development's facade program that affords small business up to $4,000 to improve the outside aesthetics of their businesses has been budgeted again this year. And this one, I didn't know what to title, so I called it Other Miscellaneous Stuff. Uh, other important projects and, and uh, subjects of note include the demolition of East Coast Seafood on Alley Street. Tom DeMarcus, who is uh, a great Linner and the owner of Old Neighborhood Foods in Lynn, has big plans for the site, and we are staying tuned to assist him in any way we can. 
We have, a fund, we have funded another year's worth of our CLT officers and downtown community policing officers, where officers connect with the public on a personal level, walking the beat, thwarting disputes and crime before it happens, especially in light of what we have witnessed in this country over the past two weeks. I believe programs like these are so important to our crime reduction efforts. In fact, as evidence of what Chief Coppinger and his team are accomplishing, official crime statistics indicate major crime is down yet again in Lynn. An additional link to keeping kids out of trouble, we hired approximately 200 summer youth through our summer youth program earlier this month. They are now hard at work in our downtown and parks, picking up trash, trimming weeds, and working at businesses such as Eastern Bank, where they will not only do an honest day's work, but will gain valuable insight into the working world. And we are excited that the YMCA is continuing their quest to acquire the necessary, necessary land in front of their current building to begin their expansion. Initial renderings of the expansion depict a magnificent state-of-the-art facility, which will no doubt increase membership and transform the Neptune Boulevard area. Lynn can also be proud to proclaim that earlier this year, we became the first city in the Commonwealth to have achieved functional zero homelessness for our veterans. Through the efforts of a coalition of workers from Lynn Housing, Lynn Community Health Center, mental health agencies, social workers, and others, we have now ensured that every veteran to, who seeks to have a home in Lynn has one. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention that, like many other cities and towns, Lynn is continuing to wage war on drug abuse particularly the abuse of opioids. We now have all of the police officers, officers in the city equipped to dispense Narcan, to reverse the effects of opioids and to save lives. At last count, our officers have revived 107 individuals from what could have been fatal overdoses. The city also hosted a summit in June to bring together nearly 100 people from all walks of life, including elected officials, public health officials, doctors, emergency responders, and addiction counselors to discuss what more can be done to slow the growth of the addiction rate in Lynn and elsewhere. Over the course of several hours, many different approaches were discussed, but all in attendance seemed to agree that early education Starting as early as kindergarten with an introduction to concepts as simple as only take pills given to you by your parent or your doctor would be a good start. So all in all, there are no shortage of projects to work on, structures to rehabilitate and businesses to assist. Collectively, all of our hard work on our public buildings, structures and roadways, in our playgrounds and open space, within our downtown, on our waterfront, with developers and with business owners, all adding up. Lynn is in a constant state of transformation, a transformation that we are excited about. Once dilapidated parks and buildings are now refurbished, open space is becoming welcoming again. Storefronts are becoming populated and developers are now knocking on our doors. I just wanna give you, which I didn't put in here, but because it wasn't really stuff that happened in the city this year, but it's coming up through the pipeline. Of the two bonds I mentioned, the second bond also includes money for us to build a new Western Avenue firehouse. I'm sorry, Western Lynn firehouse. We currently have engine seven in Pine Hill and engine nine in Tower Hill. They're both very small firehouses and they were both built about a hundred years ago and they are no longer adequate for what our needs for our public safety. So I'm looking to site a new combined Engine 7, Engine 9 firehouse on Parkland Avenue between Linwood Street and Dungeon Avenue at the base of the Water and Sewer Commission facility. This would also hold um, either 
our 911 dispatching operations, or we would use the new space for a new headquarters and move the fire department's Western Avenue headquarters over there and then renovate Western Avenue to have the 911 dispatch facilities. But either way, it's, it's sorely needed. We have not had a new firehouse in Lynn since the 1970s, and it's about time that we got another one. And lastly, um, this will be important to the Gannon folks who like to golf, but it's important to the city as a whole. We need a whole new irrigation system up there, and it's a $1.8 million project, but it is a gem and it is a destination that keeps people coming to our city. So I will also be looking for $1.8 million to renovate the irrigation system up at Gannon. So I wanna thank you all so much for the opportunity to present this information to you today. Like many organizations in the city, the Lynn Community Association is part of what makes Lynn so vibrant. Thank you again. And I'm going to take a wild guess and, and suggest that people might have questions that they might want to ask. So um, right here in the green T-shirt. Hi. I'm assuming you're talking about the bike to the sea. No, okay, but I don't know if everybody in here would know. Right. The well, the issue that I have with the current um, proposals that have been put forth by the MBTA, um, for those of you who don't know, this has been a process of converting unused rail beds and turning them into bike paths. Um, however, the MBTA does not give the land to the host city. It leases the land to the host city. My main concern has been about liability and upkeep. And I had the lawyers in the law department review the lease. They were not satisfied with the, um, with the clauses that discussed liability. And frankly, we're, we're stretched trying to keep what we have maintained here in the city. And I don't want to take on another few miles of bike trail right now. If there were a way for the MBTA to change their lease and work with us to amend it, to um, change those liability clauses to be something more favorable to the city, then I would certainly look at it again. But right now, I just um, can't support it on the advice of the law department. And is there anybody else that has a question? Jack? Uh, Mayor, Mayor, thank you for speaking tonight. Thank you for enlightening uh, us about all those uh, different projects, and thank you for coming. Uh, my question, Peter, was um, I was disappointed to hear this year that the uh, ferry wouldn't be running. I just was curious, uh, when did you find out that it wasn't going so well, and what efforts did you work with the state to try to keep it going this year? Thank you. Well, we had two years of what was to be considered a pilot program for the ferry. Um, we have met with the head operating officer of a company called New York Waterways, which is a private company that operates the ferry service in conjunction with the New York City and New Jersey transit authorities to provide ferry service in that area of the country. Um, we were getting Good ridership, about 15,000 people this year and about 13,000 people last year. But we were heavily subsidizing the trips. Um, it, it was actually mostly state money that was subsidizing the trips at a cost of about $50 per passenger per day. And um, the, the EDIC lost $650,000 on their operation of the ferry. Am I correct, Jim? And um, when we did meet with the head of the New York Waterways, he told us that there were enough people um, to support such a thing. But in order to have a truly viable ferry, what we would have to have is 
more trips because right now, uh, this past year, we only had three trips in Boston and three trips home from Boston. That's not enough to make the ferry viable. You have to have more trips during the day, a longer operating period during the day, which requires more ferries to operate on a more frequent basis during the day. We needed to have multiple stops within downtown Boston to make it workable. Um, and I don't know if I already mentioned a longer operating season because we were only operating May to September. And um, if all those things were to be put into place, then a ferry could be a great transportation alternative for this area. Um, but that is not the type of public transportation project that it could, a city can do on its own. It would require the MBTA or some other state agency to help us with the costs of that. Um, and we've all seen how much financial difficulty the MBTA has been in over the last several years. So um, I think everybody would agree that riding a ferry into the city is a wonderful way to get to work, kind of a low-stress way to get to work. We did look at different ways to try to fund it. We looked at um, a, actually there was a grant that is available to projects that will reduce carbon emissions, uh, and, and that could have been used to operate, uh, to, to help to subsidize the operation of the ferry. But as it turns out, for the number of people taking the ferry, the carbon emissions from the boat were, exceeded the number of cars that were taken off the road. So it just, it's a great idea whose time I, I think just has not yet come. We're going to need state help. Um, before it can become a reality. And for all those other reasons I enumerated, we, we just can't take it on, on our own as a city. And I know, Estelle, you had your hand up as well. <laughs> what are the chances of saving Union Hospital? Um, the state has already made its decision. Um, we have been meeting regularly with the officials at Union Hospital, trying to save some semblance of medical care in the Eastland area, in the Ward 1 area. We need that. The, the town of Linfield has been fantastic about working with us because they, too, will be left in the lurch if we don't have any medical facilities out in Ward 1. They, they depend on us. They depend on our operation of that hospital. So right now, what it looks like we're going to end up with is a, there are three different levels. There's like a walk-in center, and then there's an emergency center, and then there's um, something that operates almost like a 24-7 emergency room. And Union Hospital is committed to leaving emergency facilities in Ward 1. And what we're working with um, right now with them is to try to get the most expanded coverage and the most extent, uh, the most expanded um, offerings of, of help that we can get from them. Um, but right now, those talks are ongoing. No final decisions have been made about the date for the hospital to close or, or what this new emergency facility will look like. It's all still up in the air, but we are still talking. And that's important. Uh, no, no, there will not be a psych ward there. Um, were there other hands? Yes. Yeah, just a follow up on that. Have there been any discussions with other operating companies like Leahy or? Um, there had take over the whole there had been some interest expressed by Leahy earlier, um, but I've not heard back from them recently. But we did look. We also looked to see whether Lynn Community Health Center might want to take it over. Um, just something to keep a hospital going there. But we're caught up in, in a time where the regionalization of medical care has just become so widespread. And I don't know if you noticed, but Salem is no longer doing the, the cardiac surgery that they were doing over there as well. So we kind of got swept up on the most basic level of, of services being taken away. And Salem is getting their, their own share of um, heartache from this as well by having their, their cardiac unit being 
uh, shut down. So, you know, as I said, we're working as hard as we can to make sure that we keep good, expanded uh, emergency facilities there, not just like one of those walk-in clinics where if you have a bee sting or a sprain, they, they help you out. We want to be able to have diagnostic equipment in there and, and um, the ability to get people who are in need of additional help um, out of there quickly to another facility. So, that's it. Yes? Uh, hello, my name is Marvin, and I uh, live downtown. Uh, first off, I want to commend you and uh, uh, pretty much uh, the leadership of the city. Uh, I know you guys are working very hard on economic development, and I think that's uh, really important. Uh, my question more uh, has to do more with uh, community outreach. Um, living downtown and kind of uh, talking to people, it seems that a majority of the city really doesn't know who their counselor is, what a ward is, <laughs> and quite frankly, who you are, um, which is kind of sad. And uh, I'm sitting here looking at the state of the city address, and I'm wondering, has there been any discussion on outreach on how on connecting uh, the general population with the city government a little bit better? Because uh, I, I really think that is a major concern. I want to know what you think about that. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to tell you something funny. Um, every so often, we'll get somebody calling my office, and there are receptionists that answer the the call out in the outer office, and and they always know it's a fake when the caller on the other line says. You have to put me through to the mayor. I went to high school with him. And so we say, okay. So I know what you're talking about, about people not paying attention. We have been trying really hard to reach out to the community to get them more involved. One of the first things I did, which had never been done before, was to put up a, um, an application for a seat on boards and commissions. And it's on the city's website. It's available at City Hall. I wanted to increase the diversity of the people that were serving on our boards and commissions and give people a chance to get involved. And um, it's resulted in quite a lot of changes to the city's boards and commissions. That helps. Whenever we, well, we have something, a website now that's user friendly. We never even had a website where people could keep up with what was going on, community meetings in the city and so forth. We try to have for certain, um, really anybody who asks, any community groups or sometimes there are certain cultures. Um, I will use, for example, the Cambodian culture here in the city of Lynn. Um, there's a man named A.J. Sang who works in my office. He's a community liaison to our Southeast Asian um, members of the community. And he said to me, Mayor, I think we should have a city hall open house where we can bring in all of the members of the com Cambodian community so they can meet the leaders and the department heads and the people who are taking the money for the parking tickets that they owe and, and so forth. And he explained to me that back in the days of the Khmer Rouge, when the government came knocking on your door, that was bad news. You didn't want to have anything to do with government. And understanding that, it made sense to open the doors to City Hall, to let those people know that we are here to serve them. And it has also occurred with different other civic groups in the city of Lynn. We'll give them a little tour of City Hall, give them some historic background. Uh, we have tried to write up um, informational pamphlets for people that are looking to start a business in multiple languages. Uh, we do try to do as much outreach as possible, but the best way to get people in and involved in the city is just to walk through the doors and come on up and say, hey, I'd like to arrange a or, or call and say, I'd like to arrange a, a, a trip through City Hall so you can explain to me what goes on, who these people are. Um, we also have been broadcasting not just the city council meetings, but school committee meetings on TV. And hopefully that allows people who might not otherwise be able to stay tuned to what's going on in the city, can, can watch from the comfort of their own living rooms. Um, but, and if you have other suggestions, I am certainly open to them, but we do try. It's just that, um, as with anything in life, there are sometimes people who just are apathetic about any given topic, whatever it might be. And unfortunately, uh, we do have a lot of citizens, not certainly not a majority of them, but quite a few who are apathetic. And I'm thinking that with the election cycle that we have going on right now, the national election cycle, seems to me 
and this is just anecdotal, that more people are paying attention to what's going on, who's making decisions, what those decisions are that are being made. And maybe that is going to filter down from the federal to the state and ultimately to the local level. But um, if we can help you in any way, if you have a certain group of people that you'd like to see become more involved, give us a call and, and we'll make arrangements to give them an intro to their government officials. I'll hold you to that. I'll follow up. Please do. Thank you. Anybody else? Way in the back. Dale Orlando, Sioux Pond Association, Vice President. Just wanted to say thank you once again for your diligence in maintaining the uh, pond uh, and giving us the water treatment maintenance that we need. Um, it's been a real uh, blessing for the people that live around all of our ponds. Well, you know what I discovered, Dale, and, and thank you for that, um, is that when I came into office, the reason why they weren't being treated was because nobody seemed to have the line item in their budget. The DPW would point to water and sewer, and water and sewer would point to community development, and nobody had any set dollar amount for doing this. So it became done in a very haphazard and inconsistent manner. And that allowed the algae and the growth to reform which meant that the next tackling of it had to be more complicated, whereas maintaining it only costs, now we, we're talking a $299 million budget for the city of Lynn. Sluice Pond, um, for the first year, cost about $12,000. And what I did is I added it into my city budget. Right in the mayor's office budget is a line item for treating ponds. And then the following year or two after that, we added Flax Pond. And then I think two years ago, we added um, floating bridge pond. So now all three bodies of water are being treated on a regular basis, which results in preventative treatment rather than aggressive, reactive treatment. Um, and it's my intention to keep that funded. But sometimes something as simple as dedicating a line item to, to a problem will go a long way toward eradicating the problem. But I'm, I'm glad you're pleased. Anybody else? Okay. Well, enjoy the refreshments. Thanks again to the Knights of Columbus. Thanks again to the Lynn Community Association. And I hope all of you have a great night.